Uh, I'm Jerry Walensky. I'm a emeritus professor of neurology in the Department of Neurology at University of Texas Health. It's the Health Science Center in Houston. A uh, vast majority of patients with MS present with what we call relapses. Uh, these are episodes, discrete episodes of neurologic dysfunction. They don't come on in stroke-like fashion. They usually develop over uh, several days, not just hours or minutes, last for several weeks, and then uh, even without treatment may resolve completely. Uh, and then there'll be periods of normal or near neurologic, uh, near normal neurologic function between those. The smaller proportion of patients, uh, probably not more than 20% in most series, don't have relapses uh, or almost never have relapses, but rather present with some developing neurologic disability, which usually comes on slowly. Uh, it uh, is measured in terms of the person's perception of the evolving deficit in uh, many months to uh, longer periods of time before they actually realize that something's wrong. And that's what we call primary progressive disease. Sometimes there are attacks that occur but these are distinctly uncommon. The two types uh, probably are the same disease, uh, but the relapsing form usually begins more often in women than men. Uh, women are uh, very much disproportionately affected. And the progressive form more typically begins in men where about men and women are about equally affected. And they come on at a little bit different times in the life of the individual. We've really made great strides uh, over the last several decades in controlling and uh, reducing the frequency of attacks in patients with relapsing disease. But all of the drugs that we've developed until recently uh, have not been able to uh, control the progressive form of the disease, um, uh, even though they may fairly well control uh, relapses in the relapsing form. So until recently we've had nothing uh, of great promise for patients with uh, primary progressive forms of this disorder. Uh, ocrelizumab uh, is what's called a monoclonal antibody. These are antibodies that are uh, made by man basically using a variety of biologic and uh, molecular techniques that have specificity that is very exquisite in terms of what kinds of molecules these monoclonal antibodies bind to. Ocrelizumab binds to a molecule called CD20 and that's a molecule which is expressed on B cells a kind of circulating lymphocyte uh, and is only expressed on the B cells for a portion of their development. It's not there when they uh, are first generated, but it is there when they're in the circulation. Once they've reached a more mature state, uh, it disappears and isn't expressed anymore. So the antibody is only able to bind to that particular cell population during a very fixed part of their lifespan in the body. Uh, these cells that express CD20, these lymphocytes, are the ones that are called uh, B cells. Uh, when they're very mature, they're the ones that make antibodies that serve to uh, fight off infections, for example. So uh, ocrelizumab uh, as an anti-CD20 molecule is similar to uh, a medication which has uh, been around longer and has been used primarily in terms of autoimmune diseases in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, we haven't seen uh, unusual uh, 
infections, for example, with uh, either rituximab and certainly not with ocrelizumab. Both rituximab in some early studies were tried in uh, relapsing forms as well as in progressive forms of uh, MS. And of course, ocrelizumab has been more extensively studied in both relapsing and primary progressive disease. And fortunately, at least to date, we haven't seen any unusual infections appear with the use of these drugs. So recently there were uh, two papers which were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. One reflected two studies which were sort of merged together in the analysis in patients with relapsing disease. In that study, uh, ocrelizumab was studied in a uh, controlled fashion, randomized and controlled fashion, against a drug called interferon which has been one of our effective drugs for relapsing remitting disease, so against an active comparator. Uh, this greatly reduced the uh, frequency of relapses, even when compared to interferon, one of our early approved drugs for relapsing disease. The other paper, and one that uh, uh, has received a good deal of attention, is the one in primary progressive disease. And in that paper, what we looked at was not whether or not relapses were reduced because they're so uncommon in primary progressive disease. And in fact, in this study, patients couldn't get into the trial if they had ever had a relapse before being considered for entry into the, into the study. Uh, in that study, we used a different endpoint. We used the endpoint as to whether or not patients developed a certain amount of neurologic disability, and that disability had to evolve, be recorded, and be sustained for at least three months, and in a secondary outcome measure, which was perhaps a more important one, also needed to be sustained for six months. So showing that there was an impact on accumulating disability of the type that characterizes primary progressive MS. The study convincingly statistically met its endpoint. Quite characteristically, when we've been doing studies in, M in multiple sclerosis, essentially all forms of multiple sclerosis, we look for the ability to prevent accumulated disability, uh, usually uh, trying to do that in the absence of relapses. And uh, in the effective arms of the study, uh, especially in relapsing disease, those relapses are always attenuated for those drugs which are approved. In primary progressive uh, disease, we don't have the luxury of that endpoint to measure. So we measure this accumulating disability in the absence of relapses. There we use a, a scale which has been used across all of the studies, something called the EDSS scale. And in this study of primary progressive uh, patients, all of the patients coming into the trial already had to have a certain amount of functional disability in order to be successfully enrolled. That had to increase as they were undergoing quarterly visits uh, as part of the study. Stay increased over time in order to be um, recorded. That meant stayed increased for at least three months as well as uh, in another uh, endpoint uh, persist for six months on repeated examinations. We use something called a Kaplan-Meier curve in order to uh, look at that to see what proportion of patients have reached disability and what the difference is between the group that was on active treatment and the group that was receiving placebo.
at the three-month disability uh, confirmed point, there was a 24% reduction, and at six months, there was a 25% reduction overall. We used a number of other, I would say, more modern uh, measures of disability as well. Uh, included in that was the time it would take to walk 25 feet with or without assistance. And there, there had to be an increase in the time it took to do that test by at least 20% over what the patient's baseline was. And another test was one of something called a nine-hole peg test, where one tests manual dexterity in the upper extremities. And again, we were looking for a sustained 20% increase over baseline. All of those endpoints were met uh, in this particular study for those people who were treated actively with the drug. And in fact, if one looked at a composite of all three endpoints and looked to see which patients did not meet any of those endpoints, that is, stayed stable over the course of the trial, that was uh, increased by about 50% for those patients who were on active treatment.